Albert Einstein once wrote, all that is truly great and inspiring is created by the individual who can labor in freedom. The problem is most of us don't labor in freedom every day. We labor in fear. All we have to do is look to the events of the Middle East to see that no one enjoys working in a dictatorship, living in a dictatorship. So why do so many of us have to work in one each day? Well, we have clearly moved from the industrial age, the age in which the command and control model of business was so prevalent, into a new age that I call the democratic age, an age of unprecedented transparency, participation, voice, influence, and the tools to give real power to the people unlike anything we've ever seen before. The command and control model of business isn't compatible with this new democratic age. Instead, we need to radically reinvent our corporate operating systems. For the past 14 years, I've been studying the businesses and the leaders who are rewriting the rules of business for a democratic age. And I found one main idea that I want to share with you today, and it's this. When we consciously and deliberately choose to design our workplaces using the principles of freedom rather than fear and control, we unleash human potential, build world-class organizations, and change the world for the better. When we consciously and intentionally decide to design our workplaces using the principles of freedom rather than fear and control, we unleash human potential. We build world-class organizations and we change the world for the better. Now my own journey from command and control experiences into more freedom started back in 1997. I had just graduated from college and landed my first real job for a Fortune 500 company in the Midwest. I remember walking into work that day and I was bright-eyed, expectant, ready to engage, ready to participate, ready to bring my full self to the workplace. But I left that first day feeling completely dehumanized and dejected. I saw that I was simply going to be a cog in the machine. I wasn't going to have a voice. I wasn't going to have a say. I wasn't going to really, truly be able to participate. Maybe some of you can relate to this feeling. So after months of soul searching, I went to my boss and I resigned. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I knew you were too smart to let yourself be treated the way we treat people here. <laughs> Great, thanks man. <laughs> Even he knew the command and control system was broken and yet he did nothing to fix it. So I left and I started out on a quest. I wanted to know how could we bring democracy to the workplace? What would it look like and could it benefit the bottom line? I started a company called World Blue with this mission of bringing freedom and democracy to the workplace. And we're called World Blue because blue is universally recognized as the color of freedom. I then spent a decade traveling all over the world, and I met with some of the most progressive and leading edge companies and leaders, and I studied their models. I studied democracy in the workplace and how it could actually work. Now, when I say the word democracy, what do I mean? Well, democracy comes from the Greek, demos, meaning the people, and kraton, meaning power. So democracy obviously means power to the people. I like to think of democracy 1.0 as Athenian democracy, where democracy originated in the fourth century BC. Democracy 2.0 is political democracy. Democracy 3.0 is organizational democracy. And what, it's what we're talking about today. 
The problem with command and control in organizations is that it assumes your commander knows what they're doing. And I don't know about you, but I've been around a lot of commanders who don't know what they're doing. But the power and the beauty and the promise of organizational democracy is that it says, you know what? All the answers don't reside just with one person at the top. They can be found throughout an organization. And so we have to have a way to tap into them and hear the voice of the people. The beauty of democracy is that it assumes that every single person has worth and that you deserve to have a voice and a seat at the table. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. Now, there's some misperceptions about what democracy in the workplace can mean as well. People think it means you don't have any leaders anymore, or no decisions ever get made, nothing ever gets done. Well, that's not true. You still have leaders, you can still have a CEO, but you also have distributed leadership throughout the company, which makes it stronger. Decisions do get made, but instead of being made just in the C-suite, they're made by the people who are most affected by the decision, as well as the people who have the most knowledge about the decision. And things do get done. Now true, it's a little tortoise and hare at times, where sometimes that decision-making process, because of voting or consensus building, takes a little bit more time. But what happens is you're getting everyone into alignment, and a collective consciousness develops, so that when it comes time to execute, you can go so much faster. Now, is this just some nice woo-woo utopian idea? Democracy in the workplace, I see a few skeptical, skeptical looks. Well, I had this question myself. And so in 2007, I worked with my team, and we developed a tool that actually measures, quantifies the level of democracy within a company. We put on an open call to any business that had a minimum of five employees, it could be nonprofit or for profit, to apply for certification as a democratic workplace. Well, I'm happy to tell you that in the last five years, we've certified dozens and dozens of companies all over the world that range in size from small five-person companies all the way up to 70,000 employees, from one million in sales up to six billion dollars in sales. These, many of these companies are the leaders of their industries and their organizations such as Zappos, Hulu, Groupon, Brain Park, New Belgium Brewery, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, Great Harvest Bread Company, and many, many more. In fact, we now have individual members who are working in different companies around the world who also support these ideas from 50 different countries around the world, I should say. Now, the company is doing this just because it's you know, a great way to treat people, which it is. No, they also understand that there's a bottom line benefit to operating this way. When a company operates democratically, it increases engagement. It boosts innovation. It allows the company to attract and retain top talent, particularly Gen Y top candidates. It increases efficiency, and it allows them to provide better overall customer service. So if this is such a great idea, why aren't more, more companies doing it? Well, I think there's two reasons why more companies aren't doing it. Ego and ignorance. Now, the ego piece, I can't really do a lot about. There's some good reading, reading materials out there for those of you who, you know, sharing power is a struggle. But the ignorance piece, maybe I can help. And what I found is, from studying these companies, is that in order to build a freedom-centered workplace, it takes two things, the right mindset and the right design framework. So first, to the mindset. Most companies, as we've established, operate from a mindset of fear. And the problem is that research shows that when you're in a state of fear, it literally shuts down the peripheries of your brain, and you become myopic in what you're able to see and do. Now, that's fine. If you're a gazelle running from a cheetah in the African savanna, and the only thing that you need to do is run, I mean, that gazelle doesn't need to sit around and consider its options. But in a workplace, particularly in this day and age, we need our employees to be creative, to be using their full brain. So we have to design our workplaces from that mindset of freedom. Now, how do we get there? How do we make that, bridge that gap between fear into freedom? 
Well, there's something I call the power question. And the power question allows us to see what we're giving power to, freedom or fear. The power question is great to use when you're getting ready to make a decision. It's simple, and yet it's profound, and it's this. What would we do if we were not afraid? What would we do if we were not letting fear drive the decision? And fear can be very subtle. What would we do if we were not afraid? Imagine companies taking this into their staff meetings or corporate boardrooms to make their decisions. So first, we have to have the mindset of freedom. But secondly, to get actually designed as a democratic workplace, you have to have the right design framework. I'm deliberately using the word design rather than culture because culture grows out of design. Design is what we start with. Culture grows out of it. So over the decade that I spent researching these companies, what I found is that there are 10 principles that create a democratic design. The principles such as transparency, accountability, decentralization, choice, fairness, and dignity. All 10 principles must be in operation in order to have a democratic workplace. You can't just pick two or three that sound good. That's the value of these principles, that they are a living system. And the reason it's principles and not practices is because principles are scalable, adaptable, and universal. So mindset of freedom, the right framework to get you there. Now, has anybody heard of a company called DaVita? Yep, a few hands. They are in the healthcare industry. They're headquartered in Denver, Colorado. They're a Fortune 400 company with 1,600 clinics that provides dialysis, and they've got 35,000 employees. They're also a certified democratic workplace. Now, life wasn't always democratic at DaVita. Back in 1999, in fact, the situation was pretty bleak. They were under investigation by the SEC. Their top senior leaders were leaving, and they were on the verge of bankruptcy. So they brought in a new CEO named Ken Theory. And Ken came in and he says, you know what? We have to stop thinking of ourselves as a corporation. And we need to think of ourselves like a democratic community. So they started to make significant changes to move from that command and control structure, which was failing them, into the democratic model. So they did certain things like this. Rather than just having the C-suite be the secret society that made up all the rules, they had open town hall meetings where everyone could openly discuss and exchange ideas. Rather than just having top leaders make all the key decisions, they asked their employees to vote on everything from a name change to the strategic direction of the organization. Rather than keeping power centralized, they decentralized power to their 1,600 clinics across the nation so that they could make the best decisions to serve their people. And Ken Theory, instead of calling himself CEO, understanding the power of language, calls himself mayor of the village DeVita. Hey, it changes the mindset. It's kind of cool. Now, DeVita recognized that, look, not everyone is going to thrive in a democratic workplace, and that's OK. But they decided to symbolically create a bridge. And they invited their employees very intentionally to cross that bridge from the command and control model into the democratic model. And many, many employees did. Now, to this day, DeVita, instead of being on the verge of bankruptcy, because of their democratic transition, they are a $6 billion Fortune 400 company and the leader of their industry. Clearly, democracy in business works, and it can impact the bottom line. But it can also have a huge ripple effect on our society. Research from Gretchen Spritzer at the University of Michigan's business school has found that when a company operates democratically, it increases the level of economic prosperity in a community, it increases the level of peace, it contributes to human development, and it fights corruption. Dozens and dozens of companies are already embracing the democratic model, but I think we need to do more in order to stop this global epidemic of people working in fear. 
So here's my vision, and here's what I've committed to seeing a reality. Within my lifetime, I want to see one billion people working in freedom. One billion people working in free and democratic workplaces. Just imagine the impact this could have on our work environments, on the level of joy and happiness in our lives, on our communities, on our families, on our schools. Just imagine the ripple effect. And I want to see companies embracing the democratic model because it's smart. It's economically viable, it's spiritually advanced, and it expects and demands the best of people. Remember, when we consciously and intentionally decide to design our workplaces using the principles of freedom rather than fear and control, we will unleash human potential. We will build world-class organizations, and we will change the world for the better. With one billion people working in freedom, I believe we'll all be able to agree with Albert Einstein's statement that indeed, all that is truly great and inspiring is created by the individual who can labor in freedom. Thank you.